Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller, an African-American, licensed psychotherapist, professor, diversity coach, consultant, and author. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias, anything that marginalizes and oppresses. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, we'll have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? Thomas Kennedy says, I write about corruption and corporate greed. He is a journalist, organizer, writer, and an immigrant. Thomas graduated with an international relations major from Florida International University and a master's in community and social change from the University of Miami. Thomas has worked for nonprofits and civil rights organizations, including Service Employees International Union, the New Florida Majority, and as the political director for the Florida Immigration Coalition, managing statewide electoral campaigns and voter registration efforts. Recently, he worked for Bernie Sanders 2020 presidential campaign, where he helped manage a team of volunteers across 50 states and worked at United We Dream as national campaign manager. He currently advises progressive and immigrant rights organizations and serves as a Democratic National Committee member who is focused on reforming the institution to make it more democratic and focused on working class issues. Thomas is one of our people. He is changing the narrative, and we are so pleased to welcome him today. Welcome back, and, and thanks for staying around so we can finish this interview. Um, you know, it sounds like your immigration experience offered you lessons that were the catalyst for the focus of your education and your progressive activism, as well as your uh, the work you've done with immigration reform. What has blown your mind most about that process and developing this focus? You know, like, what were you like, I, I, I can't even believe that this is what's going on here. So I guess, can you restate the question? So yeah, so you you've you've had a long journey you you came through the immigration process you came through being undocumented you have had to navigate being a teenager in a world that like you said is based in capitalism and access privilege really and you had some access but not enough to have you bypass the challenges and obviously it it fueled you for what your focus was in school and ultimately your career but along the way did you have a point where you were like you said you know, year after year, you, you immigrants kept waiting for something else and it didn't happen. And was that the mind blowing, you know, uh, period or was it something else that occurred that that was even more crazy at that than that awareness? Yeah. So I, I guess I'll start out with with yeah the, the, the latter part of your question. So the, the way that it happened is so I got involved in so my parents, I got involved in activism because of my immigration status, but my parents were like, like lefties, right? So in, in Argentina, which is like, you know, a center left country and heavily like unionized, they were part of like the labor union, uh, you know, like 45% of like the, the Argentinian workforce is part of a union. So it's a pretty common thing. But I remember, you know, going to like marches and stuff that the union was doing and strikes with my mom. Uh, and over there, when like we have strikes, they're big, you know, there's like whole like economic sector strikes, you know, like the teacher strike, all the, the bus driver strike, all the bus driver strike. And they do like mobilizations. It's a lot like more like it's just bigger than here. Right. Like it's more organized. So I remember going to those things. Uh, so I always had like that, like, I guess, taste for it mm -hmm. from being a kid and from my parents. But I got involved um, in 2010. There was something called the Dream Act, which has, yeah. has had yeah many iterations of the same bill that have, they've been trying to pass for decades now. It doesn't end. Was one of the many iterations of it, and uh, yeah, we were undocumented. I, I think I told you before we were, uh, in, 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 frankly, embarrassed and scared to divulge our status. Uh, but my mom was basically invited to a meeting of undocumented mothers that a nonprofit organization called the Florida Immigrant Coalition was organizing. And she went, she was really intrigued by it. And I remember she came home and she was like, you know, there's people that are organizing to help people like us. And, you know, we, we have to get involved. So she started taking me to like meetings, to press conferences, to actions, to different things. 
And that's how I got involved, right? Um, you know, little by little, uh, through my mom, basically. She, okay. she organized, my mom organized me. <laughs> that um, makes sense. Yeah. And, uh, but the Dream Act failed. It didn't pass because of, you know, uh, all like most Republicans voted against it. Most Democrats voted for it, but five Democrats voted against it, unfortunately. And that's what killed it. Um, so that, but, at that time, there was the, the, the DACA program, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals was being, you know, like talked about and it was being formulated and, and, and you know, it was something that was on the horizon and the immigration movement started organizing towards that. And, you know, and I, I thought it was something good that should happen, obviously, but I personally, I was like, I don't want to, I don't want that because it's, it's, it's limbo, right? It's not permanent. Mm -hmm. And it's actually about to end because of like, you know, a, a judicial like a, a, a court decision that's coming up that's very likely to end it so but anyway so i i had the real luck uh that i had a partner who offered to uh, to to marry me like it was my actual partner at the time but yeah. basically she she we got married and that's how i got my my uh residency oh, uh, okay and, yeah. and and you know it was a lot of luck and a lot of generosity and love uh, from, you know, from from people around me that uh, allowed that. And yeah, and that's how I got my papers, uh, you know, I at least started the application process. And in terms of your question about school, you know, initially I wanted to be an architect. Oh, OK. And I wanted to go either work. I wanted to do either the Peace Corps, which is like kind of funny now <laughs> to think about, <laughs> or uh, or I wanted to go work with Doctors Without Borders because yeah. my great uncle works there. Uh, and it's just, I, you know, I want to do something that involved like humanitarianism and traveling. But again, I, I told you before, I couldn't go to school like other people had to pay, you know, as a foreign student. I, I ended up taking one class at a time per semester, which is insanely slow. I ended up dropping out because it was too expensive. Um, so I couldn't really pick up my studies until I got my papers in 2014. That's when I, and by, and by that time, you know, I had like kind of like lost interest in architecture. Yeah. I was really involved in activism and I just ended up doing like humanities, international oh, relations. Wait, so at any point, did one thing shock you more than the other? Cause it's all so, so shocking to me. And at, at some point, did you just get used to it? You know, sort of expect it to be as challenging as it was, or did you think, man, this place is more screwed up than I thought? The United States? Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I don't know if shocked is the right word. Okay. But, you know, it's just frustrated. Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, that like it, it just plugs you into the dysfunction or makes you more aware about the dysfunction within the the American governance than most people, right? I think I think now after the Trump years there's been like an awakening of like mm -hmm. civic engagement and like mindfulness of politics among more of the American populace, but not all of them. But, you know, growing up and never seeing, you know, like Congress be able to do something like immigration reform really attunes you to like looking at the legislative process and how stagnant it is yeah. and how, you know, not geared towards helping like the people of this country, you know, it, it really is. So, you know, it's it just, it was just a very frustrating, um, experience and uh and it, and, it, and it does feed a healthy amount of cynicism within mm -hmm. you about mm -hmm. just like political parties and promises that are made to people right um and and how you know people's stories and struggles can be used as political footballs by both yeah. sides of the aisle without delivering any sort of like actual relief to these people absolutely and i, I love that you you correct that shock because why should we be shocked of anything that happens anymore and i think shock is a distraction so i appreciate you clarifying that you know frustration and disappointment is more more accurate all right so you ended up in miami florida and with your help the florida immigrant coalition registered 29,000 voters in 2018 and 19. You were a part of the campaign by the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition to pass Amendment 4, which restored voting rights to 1.4 million Floridians. You also helped to lead a campaign to close detention camp for the migrant children in, in Homestead. 
what do you think was the key to your success around this? Uh, yeah, I mean, so all those things were done in a very collaborative manner. Oh, of course. With a lot of people. So, um, but yeah, so I, I was I was stating um, how, you know, my mom actually got involved through a meeting that the Florida Immigrant Coalition mm -hmm. uh, organized, right? Uh, and I ended up through, you know, through volunteering and activism, I ended up working and becoming the political director of, of, of FLIC, the Florida Immigrant Coalition. Okay. Which, you know, I think it's a, a really, like all nonprofits, they have their issues, but I think it's a special organization in terms of like, they recruit from, you know, their ranks, directly impacted people, people that are committed, empower them, and then they hire them and, you know, allow them to, you know, take a little bit of control within their, you know, in terms of their destiny and their stories. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you know, what it, what was... Uh, the recipe, I guess, for like the success that I've had. Um, I don't know, just just a lot of just hard work and community support and being surrounded by great people, um, you know, that that helped to make the work happen. In fact, so I'll tell you another story that I think uh, answers this question more. So in 2015, th this is when I actually... Because before I was like an activist and I would go to things and I was involved, but I wasn't like all in, in, in terms of like activism. And it was in 2015 that I became all in. So my dad, um, who's a construction worker, needed a double hip replacement because he has a form of degenerative, degenerative arthritis in both of his hips. Wow. Um, and he couldn't get the operation because he wasn't documented. Um, so, you know, it... it, it the situation, you know, degraded and degraded and degraded until the point that he couldn't walk anymore because it was too painful, you know? So he was like bedridden. He couldn't wor work. He was a primary breadwinner at the time. Um, so it, it really impacted my family emotionally, mm -hmm. but also like economically, like substantially. And I was living in Gainesville at the time. Uh, I was working for the University of Florida. Um, not, I wasn't going to school there, but I was working there. Um, and I just had like a really nice, calm life in Gainesville. It was very cheap, you know, and my dad got sick and I had to move back from Gainesville to Miami to help him out because he would, he literally couldn't walk. He couldn't work. Wow. Uh, and we were desperately trying. It was a $90,000 operation, $90,000 for double hip replacement, which by the way, in Argentina, he could have basically have done it for free because we have socialized health care, we have public health care. But he couldn't go to Argentina because he was undocumented. So if he left, he can't come back here for 10 years. So he didn't have that option. And my dad was like, please, like we would go to like hospitals and places and be like, just finance. We will pay per month. We'll pay whatever it takes. Like, you know, and they left him. You know, like I was I was about to say like a dog, but like you shouldn't even leave a dog like that. Like you, should, you wouldn't leave an animal like that. You know what I mean? So they left him, you know, just. And at the time, my friend, uh, Carlos Roa, who's another immigration activist that's well known, he walked actually from Miami to Washington, D.C. in something called the, the Trail of Dreams uh, at the time. His dad got, I think it was brain cancer. His dad was also undocumented at the same time. And again, they did no insurance. They didn't give him chemotherapy because he didn't have insurance. They told him, you know, only emergency room. He died. He oh, died of cancer. Yeah. And again, they let they let this person die. The American healthcare system saw this person that had brain cancer. They had the opportunity to treat him. They denied coverage and they let this person die. And my dad, they let him, you know, fester in his misery for a long time. And then, you know, we were like, like many American families do, undocumented or not undocumented. We did. What we had to do, which is to create a fucking GoFundMe, <laughs> people for money. So, we made, and no shame in that. So, yeah. we created a GoFundMe. We ended up raising like I think eighteen thousand dollars. And my dad actually, we were so lucky. We he um he remodels houses. So he had a client in the past that that was an orthopedic sur uh, surgeon. Wow. And he's heard about the GoFundMe and everything, and he was like, look. Because also it was great publicity for him, right? It's a like human interest story, but also like incredibly generous. He was like, just give me the money that you have in your GoFundMe. Don't worry about the rest. We'll operate. 
and that's it. Let's call it even. Oh my God. It incredibly, I mean, $18,000, but it was a $90,000 operation. Mm -hmm. So possibly more, you know, depends on where you do it. So he, so we were able to, my dad was able to get the operation. It was like a miracle after like two years of struggling with this, you know, trying to figure out somehow. Um, and yeah, and I remember my dad was um, recovering. You know, he was like passed out in the bed, you know, like right after the surgery. So you can, imagine, you know, they did one, they did the second one. It was after, after oh the God. second one. Wow. He was just incredibly messed up, you know, and I was with him in the bed, in, in bed, you know, in his bed. I was chilling with him. He was like passed out, you know, on like medication, whatever. And I remember I look at the TV and what do I see? Hmm. I see Donald Trump going down that escalator. I swear to God, going down the escalator, remember? Mm hmm going up to a podium and announcing his run for presidency and talking uh, about the Mexicans are rapists and they're not sending their vest and they're, they're bringing drugs or, you know, all, we know the, we know the, the, yeah. the and I remember just looking at that, looking at this man who, you know, had everything given to him, literally like a spoiled rich kid. And then looking at my dad who, you know, has worked, you know, so hard all his life, you know, complex man, flawed like all of us, but like a good, hardworking person and just and him talking shit about like, you know, Trump, sorry, excuse my language. But no, no, shit is fine. Hearing, you know, Trump talking shit about all about immigrants and other people. Mm -hmm. and I just mean like, what a piece of shit. I'm just getting so mad about the whole si everything, the whole situation. That's when I was like. That's it. Like, this is what I'm going to do from now on. Okay. And I don't care if I fail, if I don't, if it's a great contribution, if it's a small contribution, but people like this need to be opposed. This was not the first one. You know, I remember growing up and like watching Fox News after coming home from school and seeing people like Tom Tancredo, who people might not remember him, but he was like a old school Mm -hmm. GOP congressman who would like was really anti-immigrant would talk about how immigrants bring leprosy and diseases so that like Trump is not a new thing that guy has been around you know, you. for for a long time and I was like and and, and I, I swear I, I'm not a guru I wasn't one of these people I was like Trump is gonna win but I did have a bad feeling about it and I remember wow. being like I've heard this before this is dangerous and that's, yeah. that's when I went all in that's an amazing catalyst and an important one. And we, we, unfortunately, we all had that feeling. It was like a, I remember having a, a party, an election party that turned out to be one of the most depressing events in, ever in life. So I'm right there with you. All right. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Thank you for sharing that story. No um, <clears throat> you came to the right state to fight uh, corruption and, and corporate greed. Tell us yes. a little bit about, <laughs> tell us a little bit about you suing uh, DeSantos, is it, in federal court? Talk about that a little bit, whatever you can say about it. Yeah, yeah, sure. So basically, um, yeah, I'm suing DeSantis in federal court because um, I went to a press conference that the governor was doing at the Port of Miami. And I've had my run-ins with the governor in the past. I've press events of his, or if I've asked uncomfortable questions, you know, I've made interruptions, you know, I've, I've, I've been an advocate for a long time, but I went to this specific one at the Port of Miami, okay. uh, where he was declaring a lawsuit against like cruise ships related to like their vaccination requirements. So I decided to go. And, you know, as soon as I get to the Port of Miami, which again, for folks that don't know, Port of Miami, a public place funded by our tax dollars, Anyone can go, and there's actually public transportation that goes there. You can get on a bus, you can go there. So right. a place that anyone can go. So I go there. As soon as I enter the port, I pull up in the parking lot, which is far away from where the Santos is having his enclosed press conference in a building. I am s immediately swarmed by several police ca cars, patrol cars. Oh, my God. And they walk up to my window, and they're like, you know, they knock on my window and they're like, step out of the car. So I'm like, all right. So I step out of the car. They're like, hands right, right where we can see them. I'm like, here they are. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, hand put, put your hands on the vehicle. They search me. They grab my stuff, you know, and they basically have me there for about, I think, like 30, 40 minutes. And then at, at the end of it, they are, they tell me, look, we have an order for you. 
I'm like, an order from who? There, I told this all on video, by the way. It's like we can't, t- we can't say that, but you're gonna be trespassed out of the port. So we're we're gonna escort you out. You're gonna have to drive with us, or we're gonna arrest you right now. And I was like, what? Okay, why why have I been detained for 40 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever? And why am I being trespassed? What the hell did I do? They're like, don't worry about it. You just have to go. And I'm like, isn't this a public? It's on the video. I'm like, isn't this a public place? They say, not for you. You have to leave right now. So whatever. So they ended up escorting me out. I I never attempted to enter the press conference for the sentence. Never went to the checkpoint. Nothing. So in my head, I'm like, okay. They were either following me or they were looking out for my vehicle Mm -hmm. as I entered the port. And they know what my vehicle is. And they had an order to stop my vehicle. So my, 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 my friend, Grant Stern, uh, helped me out with the public records request process. And we basically uncovered an incident report where they say that the Florida Department of Law Enforcement shared my personal and vehicle information with Miami-Dade police oh. at the behest of the governor's office to basically keep tabs on me. So I was like, okay, this is something. And then from that, we were able to get public records requests from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement that uncovered an 89-page dossier on me that has my personal information, my a, a, a record of my political activities that they themselves, by the way, acknowledge that has no history of violence, uh, a list of a so-called associates. It's labeled associates, has names, photos, and comments. It's all redacted, so I don't know who's on this list. Um they track my social media posts. They have screenshots of social media, metrics of how many times it's been shared. They even took screenshots, 89 pages of people, what they comment on my post, what I post. So you have people at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement that are getting paid salaries to basically, you know, tr- like monitor the social media of like nonviolent activists. So, so, so that, that's what precipitated the lawsuit. Basically, we're suing to make sure that a p- people can access the governor's events more. And we're not talking about his campaign events. He can do whatever he wants with his campaign events. We're talking about his publicly funded official side governor events, right? Through his governor's office. We want able people to be able to access these events, which should be open to the public because we're paying for them. They kicked me out of their press list. Like you can sign up to receive their like press yeah. releases. Right, right. We played like a cat and mouse game where they would like remove my email and I would add myself until they, they blocked me. I have the screenshots. I am blocked. That's another thing that we want. We want people to at least be able to access like their electronic correspondence. Again, this is like the public side, not the campaign side. As constituents, we should be able to get that. Um, so that's another thing. Uh, there's other, there's other, there's like journalists that have been blocked, you know, uh, people like Grant Stern, who has been kicked out, people like Ben Frazier, you might remember him from mm-hmm. earlier this year in Jacksonville. Yeah. He's, you know, an, an older black man who's on a wheelchair, by the way, and a member of the National Association of Black Journalists. He was at a Ron DeSantis press conference. Somebody recognized him because he's a prominent, you know, advocate for things aside from being a, an Emmy winning journalist. Mm-hmm. They recognized him and they asked him to leave before the sentence even came out. He was not being disruptive. He was just standing there. He was like, why do I have to leave? I'm just here, you know, as, as a member of the press. They asked him to leave. He wouldn't leave. They arrested him. They arrested him and charged him. This man was on a wheelchair, you mm-hmm. know, like it's, you know, it, it's shameful, you know, like, so yeah, so we, we want people to be able to access these events and question. The, the, you, they can kick you out if you're disruptive, you know, but you should be able to access and at least have the opportunity to engage with your elected officials. And then the last thing that we want is um, we want the unredacted copies of these dos- of this dossier because mm-hmm. we want to see who is in this list of associates that I mentioned of mine, right? Because that that is unfair to the people that are associated with me that they are being monitored now for what, 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 what are, you know, what are the, the, the reasons? And it's also unfair to me because now people have to worry about being associated with right. me and I have to worry about associating with people. I, I just think it's like a, a, a total unconstitutional nightmare, what they're doing. Um, and yeah, we filed a, a lawsuit in federal court and we're <laughs> waiting to hear back. We, we know everybody, we've been notified that everybody 
has been served. Uh, I think the state or the FDLE, if I'm correct, I could be wrong, filed a motion to dismiss. So we're about to, you know, go through the discovery. Um, so we'll see what happens. Oh man, it's amazing. It's amazing. Look, anyone who follows you on social media knows how smart, driven, Thank and you. how brave you are. Thank I want to make that very clear. Um, you know, like you said, you could be white passing, slip under the radar, go unnoticed and assimilate like so many others do. Instead, you've taken on this fight and I have nothing but respect for you. I just want to make Thank that really clear. I really, I mean, I'm a fan. You know, people, uh, I, I, again, I, I have to say it again, what you're doing is incredible and, um, and you should be praised all the way. I can't wait till you run for office. I'm super excited about that. Oh, thank you. I don't know <laughs> if I ever will. No, but I just, you know, I just think it's important. It just makes me so mad, um, especially in this state. Um, just the level of just corruption yeah. and willful and malicious negligence by mm -hmm. our, like, our, our elected officials uh when there are so many real problems you know right. like housing mm -hmm. flooding uh property insurance you mm -hmm. know are issues with suspended licenses in the state people get their licenses suspended indiscriminately and then you know they can't drive they can't get to work right uh you know i don't know health care uh prison industrial population. yeah the incarcerate mass incarceration mm -hmm. you know there's so many problems in our state, and instead we have these grifters that don't do anything at the local level. At the state level, they've, they've just gone full fascist. Mm -hmm. All they do is pick, is pick on the vulnerable, you know, whether it's immigrants. Now they're later. Right. The, their, their, their latest obsession is, you know, picking on transient individuals, mm -hmm. you know, in the LGBTQ community. Right. It's disgraceful. It is. Disgraceful and it's embarrassing to watch and I just, I, I can't stand it. <laughs> Look, I wonder why people are not outraged all the time. And that's, that's the one question that I ask frequently, why aren't people more outraged? And so my, my question is, is twofold. One, how do you manage your mental health? Cause I, I know what being on the front line can do to a person. So how do you manage to stay grounded and stable in this, in this, uh, in the work that you're doing? Cause it's powerful and it's, it can be consistently overwhelming. Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I mean, I, I definitely think um, it's 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 like it's it's tough, right? I mean, there's definitely I am like often inundated with feelings of like cynicism and negativity and hopelessness, to be quite frank. You know, I'm just being fully transparent. And sometimes I do feel like, man, like this is hopeless, you know, mm -hmm. but what's the alternative? You know, I mean, so, you know, we just keep going. And then, you know, sometimes good things happen, you know, and, and, and people triumph over evil, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's like, I mean, this is like a bit corny because it's one of his like most overused quotes and most famous one. He has so many, so many good ones, but I think it's a great one. So I'm just going to say like Martin Luther King's uh, mm -hmm. quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Right. I mean, I really do like that quote. So I just try to keep that in mind. Um, and I do think overall, like the world the, the the human experience has gotten better throughout history right? right yeah i think we're in a better place than we were in like the 1700s than we were in the 1800s than we were in the 1900s you know i think we 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 are moving slightly you know very incrementally towards a better human experience but it, we're still not there you know and, and, and I think we're in a very dangerous place mm -hmm. because of the existential threat of climate change and because of technology. Like technology holds the potential to unlock like, you know, like the full promise of like of humanity, right? Like we could automate labor, right. we could have renewable energy, you know, we could, you know, we, we could have so much, but at the same time, we have technologies that can be used to surveil individuals, to oppress, right? You know, to to create a truly tyrannical society, mm -hmm. and I think it's very dangerous because, again, we are living in a in a in a in a in a time where people are losing faith in democracy. You know, people are seeing, you know, like the the the, the collapse of you know an environmental ecosystems and droughts and famines, you know, and that creates 
a, a potential for something better or something worse. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think we actually, what I'm getting is I think we live in like a pivotal time in human existence right now. And it's incumbent on all of us to try to steer it in the right direction because there's malicious actors, some of them in Florida that are like fighting every single day and every single night to steer us in the oppressive, reactionary, fascist direction. Well, and also not just Florida. I mean, it's real easy to pick on Florida. It's so obvious. You got a you know, mayor in Miami who's more worried about uh, his Bitcoin than he is about anything else. I mean, it's, it's, there's so many examples in Florida, but I think because of that, other states and cities get to hide out when they're yes. just, just as evil, just as evil. They're just more covert. And it is, it is a discouraging time, but I, I like what you said. And I, and I want people to hear that, especially, you know, the young Thomases who see you as a role model. I want them to hear what is the choice? What's the alternative? I think I mean, that's really important. Yeah, no, the alternative is a, a brighter, more tolerant, mm -hmm. equitable future, you know, in which again, we can, realize like the full potential that we have as a human species and let's face it like we are awesome like we have done incredible things we have the potential to do so many more incredible things i mean we are like incredible like i, I do believe that right yeah but we also have the potential to be incredibly dumb incredibly destructive incredibly hateful and incredibly awful to one another mm -hmm. so that, those are the choices do right. we want to like be realize our full potential and live in a compassionate you know equitable fair and kind society or do we want to be mean cruel selfish and awful to each other and and, and, and i know which side i'm on and i well, know which side wants to steer us in the other direction i i think i think that just one layer i would add to that is you have made a choice and that's what people need to do. People need to make a choice. You have said, I know what side I want to be on. And that's what I don't think enough people have done. Make the conscious choice to do the right thing. You know? I agree. No. And look, if you don't make the choice, it's like that another a corny cliche saying, if you don't do politics, politics is going to do you. I mean, look at, look at FPL right now, Florida Power and Light. They just raised rates on consumers I by know. a lot. Like people are having like close to a hundred dollars or more to pay that they have to pay, you know, extra per, per month on their utility bill. You want to know why that happens? There's an entity called the public service commission in Tallahassee. It's the regulatory body that oversees public utilities in Florida. So the way this commission works is that the governor appoints the members, but they are approved by the Florida Senate. So I'm sure you have seen, Mm -hmm. all these election schemes that Florida Power and Light has running ghost candidates, mm -hmm. you know, uh, looking for primary opponents against, you know, pro-environmental Democrats, you know what I mean? Uh, funding fake news sources like the capitalists to smear opponents, you know, and, and do like fake, you know, propaganda pieces that are positive of them, hiring private investigators to trail people like South Miami Mayor Philip Stoddard, who's again a proponent of solar power. But when you look at their election fraud schemes like the ghost candidates, notice they are never geared towards uh, 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 Florida House members, right? They're always towards Florida Senate members because those are the ones that get to, to approve the members of the Public Service Commission, which are appointed by the governor. And they have a Public Service Commission that is completely beholden to FPL's interests. They're all just cronies and hacks. Right. And again, these are the people that can approve FPL's racing your, your bill at the end of the month. You know what I mean? So again, I say that just to tell people, if you don't do politics, politics is going to do you, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the sense you're going to have to pay more for, you know, whatever it is, you know, your housing is going to your housing prices is going to increase. You're not going to have public transportation. It's going to get harder to, to, to get health care. Your, your neighborhood is going to flood, you know, the many ways that that's going to happen. You, you got to get involved. You know, people say, you know, again, I'll use that same saying, you know, how much worse can it get? You don't know until you sit back and do nothing. And, I, and that's what I hear you saying loud and clear. And I appreciate you pushing that message, both on your social media and in this conversation. So let everybody know where they can find you on your social media handles, please. 
Sure, yeah, and, and you know how bad it can get. Let's see when when a a, a a a powerful enough hurricane hits Miami, and let's see how that this this, this infrastructure, you know, exactly. handles that. Exactly. <laughs> and, and what the response and services are to you know struggling residents like ourselves. But um, so people can find me at at Tomas Ken T O M A S K E N N. Excellent on uh, Twitter and uh instagram yeah just twitter and instagram I'm trying that's to... enough you do enough my god i can't all the information you share is like incredible so you don't need to be managing other social media yeah, um so people, are, so people are like you should get a TikTok." i'm like i, I can't you, you don't even need to what you do is powerful <laughs> enough so look clearly i could have a conversation with you that goes on and on so please promise to come back so we can catch up on what's happened since this conversation would you would you do that yeah, no, this was really fun. And actually, I never get to share about like, uh, I guess, like my in-depth personal story like that. So it was nice. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Look, this podcast is about educating people, lifting important voices who are doing the work and empowering sure. people. You know, clearly you're doing all of the above. So what's the message you want to leave people with today? Um, Again, just stay hopeful. Um, humans are awesome like i just want to reiterate that we have the potential to do so much good but we also have the potential to do so much bad and you know we get involved if you want to see a change you know get involved find your political home find people that also you know want to enact change with you and fight for it you know so yeah. that's my message just just get involved don't lose hope don't give in to doomerism and you know what, you know, get involved doesn't mean doing what you're doing. It can mean giving five dollars to the to the candidate who's fighting for the cause you believe in. It could be helping people register. It could be driving people like people yeah. have to really, you know, make that as small as is manageable for people who are working full time and trying to make a living. It's just everybody does a little bit makes a little bit better. It makes it a little bit better. I agree. I Tomas. Agree. Kennedy, you are awesome. I really, really appreciate uh, the conversation and everything I've already mentioned. Uh, thank you again so much for coming on. And I look forward to the next conversation. For sure. And I like your cat. <laughs> <laughs> you think you mean my co-host? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. I'll hit you up uh, soon when everything's uh, ready to go up. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tomas. Bye. Bye-bye.